Brooks, how our next guest uh, describes himself. Uh, and indeed, uh, who could uh, argue with a man who's been both a successful barrister and renowned playwright and novelist for almost 40 years. Among his most notable achievements was uh, the superb television adaptation of Evelyn Waugh's classic novel, Brideshead Revisited. And his own best-selling novel, Paradise Postponed, was made into a major television series. But undoubtedly, his greatest creation was the comic Old Bailey hack, Horace Rumpo, Rumpo of the Bailey. Now, he first appeared on our television screens in a BBC play for today back in 1975. Did you read this when you were at the police station? Of course I did. Did you understand it? Read it through, didn't I? Well, I wasn't there, old darling. Yeah, I read it through. Then why did you sign it if it wasn't true? I got bored. Oh. They were going on so long. Mm. You ever been questioned in the nick? Not as far as I can remember. It gets boring. You do anything like to get it over with. Like getting back to your cell like and reading like a comic like. Yeah. That's it. I was doing reading. I tell you what, if I sign this, they promise me a smoke like. Didn't that strike you as a rather expensive cigarette? So, Lumpel's uh, first, <laughs> first appearance on television, now that was, he was just a character, a one-off in a play. That was a, a one-off play, it was a play for today, mm. and I'd been thinking about this character, because I thought I needed a character to keep me alive in my old age, like Sherlock <laughs> Holmes or Maigley or someone. And so I just wrote one play about him. Right, so what, what happened? Did, did Lumpo take you over or take Liam McKern <laughs> over or the producers? What, what? Well, I, when I wrote it, I never thought of Liam. I thought, I thought the part could be played by Alastair Sim. Oh, but yes. Alastair Sim was unfortunately dead and unable to take it on. Mm. So that uh, uh, I thought of Liam. I think we all thought of Liam. I'm going to break in, John, because mm. very relevant to this, we have a call from Jennifer McLagan. Uh, and Jennifer, well, I think... It's going to be from Alistair Sim. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the spirit world. Because uh, I think you have a, a question relevant to exactly that, don't you? Uh, yes, I have. Um, hello, John. Good morning. Uh, my question is really, I, I love Rumpole. I've read the books and I love the television series. Um, but Leo McKern, the, the character just fits him like a glove. He is wonderful in the part. And my question really was... Did you have him in mind, or has he made the part his own? Mm. Well, I didn't have him in mind, and he then did it, that first play that you've just seen a bit of, and then it was he who suggested that he, we shouldn't let the character go and that he should do the first series. So really the idea of doing a lot of Rumpel plays came from him. But it's one of those wonderful accidents that happen to you about once in a lifetime, if you're lucky, was that the perfect actor was, was there to do the part. Absolutely. And now, of course, it would be impossible to think of anybody else doing it. I mean, Nigel, as an actor, it is perfect casting, isn't it? Well, I, yeah. I know. Yeah. I, I think it's just the most extraordinary invention. And again, I think it's beautifully acted and beautifully mm. written, if I may say well, so. Right. And also, that, I mean, it's a, it's a great honour to sit next to this man because he's one of our great, great um, screenwriters and uh, novelists. And um, I'm really basically buttering him up so that he can write <laughs> something <laughs> for me. Well, I'll get you back. I'd love to do something. That you must written. do another murder. Yes, I'll do another murder. <laughs> I thought you might have been up to that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> now, that's a very interesting point that was just raised because is it true, I mean, I read, um, uh, to support that question, that the series only came back recently because Leo McKern put his hand up and said, hey, I'd like to do some more. Well, it's the fourth, it's the fourth of them. And after every one, he's very understandably had this feeling that he doesn't want only to be thought of as Rumpo. And of course, he does mm. all sorts of other wonderful things. Mm. But um, he came back from Australia, and he was very pleased to do this. And I think the last series was the happiest one we've ever done. Yes. I think the, the scripts were, were good, and I think he was wonderful. So I hope now that he'll do more. I think he may. Right. Uh, another call, John, from Sally Henstock. I um, don't know where you're calling from, Sally, but we'll hear in a moment. Hello, Sally. Oh, hello. I'd also like to say that I'm a great fan of Ron Paul as well. Thank you. Um, is Ron Paul based on your own experiences as a barrister, or is he purely fictional? Well, when I thought of I needed this character, I needed a sort of permanent character to keep me going, I thought of my father... Uh, and my father wore Rumpo's uniform, which is a black jacket and striped trousers and cigar ash down the watch tray. <laughs> and my father used to always quote poetry at very inapposite moments. I mean, when I was a child, every time my father saw me, he used to say, is execution done on Cawdor? 
which when you're four is a pretty <laughs> tough question to have to answer. So I thought of that. Then I thought of a lot of barristers I'd known around the Old Bailey, who always called the judge old darling and never called their wives old darling. And then I thought, I put a lot of, rump of myself in Rumper, and now all the things I think, which if I say them, they sound rather sort of left-wing and trendy, <laughs> and when he says them, they sound rather crusty and acceptable. <laughs> so he's a mixture of all those things. He's a mixture. Does that, does that answer you, Sally? Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> right. Could we have our next call, please? And our next call is Jill Abbott. Jill, where are you phoning from? From Reading. From Reading, yes. Your, your question is John Mortimer. John. Good morning. Um, right. I wanted to know whether Rumpel would ever make being a judge, whether he'd ever get on the bench. I'm afraid he wouldn't. And he wouldn't be at all a good, he'd be an appalling judge. Because as Nigel knows, uh, what you have to be as a judge is quiet for a minute or two. You know, you should keep quiet and listen to some of the evidence. Whereas Rumpel would be arguing <laughs> for the defence all the time. Everyone would get off. And the Lord Chancellor would put a stop to him very rapidly. <laughs> to be very quiet. <laughs> my, my, my father's telling me that my grandfather used to keep um, in the afternoons would have a copy of the Sporting Life in amongst all the other debris. <laughs> and he'd always put a bet on and uh, when the clerk of the court would hand up the slip saying whether he'd won or not, it would be a different sort of man. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why Rumpo could do that, but I don't think he could do Actually, that. some people have said that the real triumph is that you've made a lawyer saving your presence and your legal family, you've made a lawyer a sympathetic and popular person because I would think in the list of, of people who are not greatly loved, yes. uh, lawyers, solicitors, barristers and so on. Income tax inspectors, traffic wardens. Right. Um, yes, and one of my aims really was to say everybody thinks that lawyers are rich and dishonest, so I wanted to have a lawyer who was poor and honest. And also, I think that what I'm trying to say is that we all may despise lawyers, but in fact our age-old liberties, the idea that people have to prove that you're guilty, the idea that you're entitled to be tried by your peers, everyone can't be imprisoned without trial, keeping alive all those things depends on some rather poorly paid old hacks mm. who will trudge around some pretty unsympathetic courts. Because you still genuinely believe, although you mock it and show its yes. weaknesses, that the fairest deal for a chap or, or, or a girl... Is to, is to be is tried in a British court, absolutely. Yeah. I think one of the most unpleasant experiences for a chap or a girl is to be sentenced to a British prison, but that's not Rumpel's area. Right. Yeah, he wants to keep him out of there. Yeah. We have a call now from Dorothy Nicholson. Uh, Dorothy, you're f calling from London, I believe. That's right, yes. Yes. Y your, your comment to John Mortimer? I'm interested in to, to know if it's you appearing in the crowd scenes of Rumpel. <laughs> well, I do do a rather narcissistic thing and occasionally buy a cup of coffee in one. Yes. <laughs> do you? But I did a bit of acting. Um, and Nigel better be look out because I, I did a bit of acting in a Faye Weldon uh, play. And I've got an equity card now, so I could actually Ooh. open my mouth in a rumper. So, a <laughs> heartthrob John Mortimer. <laughs> that's right. Dorothy, that's very... You're, you've discovered something that is not amongst all the cuttings I read. Mm. So you do a Hitchcock every now and again. I do, I do. I, I, I buy a cup of coffee in had the you, ABC. Had you spotted John Mortimer then, Dorothy? Had you... Yes, I had. There and you uh, I had an argument with my husband. And, uh, and But in other uh, scenes, I forget to look because I get so involved in the story. Well, I, I just flashed past. That's right. Well, I hope you had your, a bet with your husband, because you would have won the bet. Uh, no, I haven't. Can you remember, it, was, it, was it in Rumpole that you saw uh, the author sipping a cup of coffee? Yes, he was yeah. carrying a tray. I was. <laughs> yes. It was one of the best carried trays in the entire That's right. series. Yes. <laughs> Dorothy, thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Thank you very much. Uh, and we have another call now uh, from Duncan Slater. Duncan, where are you phoning from? Oh, hello, I'm phoning from Stirling. Lovely. Good afternoon, John. Good afternoon. Uh, after all the wonderful work which we've had from you uh, in the past, can we expect more on television? Yes, well, I hope now, I think now that, uh, that Leo will agree to do another lot of Rumpels. Mm -hmm. So um, I hope sometime next year we'll Any do that. Any more apart from Rumpel? Well, I'm trying to write a novel at the moment, and it's so difficult that I sort of feel I come to Manchester and talk on the television. <laughs> <laughs> Right, thank you very much for that. Thank, thank you very much. Um, we had a call from uh, David Hope uh, from Sunderland. Uh, is it difficult to adapt books into television series? Now, I wonder about this. I mean, you, you, you adapted your own for Paradise Postponed, but um, Brideshead Revisited. Now, you're a writer, so therefore yeah. you would have a great 
regard and respect for another writer, yeah. even war, whether actually you're fearful of tampering with somebody's work, someone you would respect as much as even war. No, I don't think you're fearful. Uh, it, it's an entirely different thing. I don't regard adapting something for television as an original artistic creation. The difficult work in any work is to think of the story, think of the theme, think of the characters, think of what it is. And Evelyn Ward did all that. And if Brideshead was a success, I hope in whatever conservative Catholic heaven he's now sitting in, drinking his glass of brandy, he's happy. Because it's all down to him. And, and an adaption really, in a way, is A, it's carpentry, but secondly, I think it's rather like appearing for a client in court. What I wanted to do was to present Evelyn Ward to the public in, uh, as well as possible. Mm. And I wanted the public to know about it, but his best or his worst. So when he wrote terrible lines, like, I was made free of her narrow loins, I put that in in order that everyone could see that Evelyn Ward could write just as badly as everyone else who <laughs> put his mind to it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> because with Paradise Postponed, which, which ran on Thames very successfully, um, you were actually writing two things at once, weren't I you? I did. I wrote them both at the same time. I can't think how I did it. I went quite insane. Because um, what I did was to write the idea of Paradise Postponed in handwriting on a bit of paper. And because they never read it, both the television company and the publishers bought it. And so I was committed to doing them both at the same time. I see. That's how it came about. <laughs> now, I'm going to, I'm going to interrupt uh, for a moment because uh, we have, for the second time this morning, a wonderful surprise uh, for, <laughs> for Nigel Havers because I think we have um, his, his dad, Sir Michael, phoning from Spain. Uh, I hope that's correct, Sir Michael. Yes, yes. Wonderful. Good morning, <laughs> to Danny and John and Nigel. <laughs> Very, very good, good morning. Very good to have you with us. Are, are you having a nice rest and relaxation? Yes, well, and um, feeling absolutely 100%. Well, Sir, uh, Sir Michael, you, you may have gathered the, 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 the game is that you, ha you ask a question of uh, the guest of the day, and I wonder whether you have a question for one Nigel Haber sitting in the studio. <laughs> yes, what does his future look like? <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a father. I've, I've no idea, Dad. I'm sorry. Um, no, he's looking all right. I'm going to... I'm going to be, uh, you're in Spain. How nice to hear you. <laughs> How, how are you feeling? Well, I'm going to be in Spain too. I'm um, uh, later on, end of the month, going to be making a yeah. film out there. But you'll probably be back at your desk by then. Could we have? Could we have your views, Sir Michael, on uh, the series that uh, uh, your son is here to talk about? Um, do you do you see the series? Um, yes. Yes, and can you... I love them because I'm a great friend of Tony's too, and I think they get on so well together. Do you get on as well with Nigel as, as the two characters get on in the, in the series? Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> it's a very happy relationship. Really his mother just sent her love to him. Sorry, we missed his that. His mother just sent her love to him. Oh, lovely. Very yeah. good. It's Family show, this is. <laughs> would, you like, would you like to, uh, I don't know, just wish Dad a happy holiday? Yes, I, I have a lovely time, and um, I'll see you when you get back. OK, night. No. Great. Good luck. God bless. Bye. <laughs> what a lovely surprise. Thank you. <laughs> yes, for the second You'll time. You'll tell me the bill, though. <laughs> 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 no doubt. <laughs> I must say, we, we were talking we we're talking about things which are archetypal British and, uh, and whatever, and uh, the interesting thing about Nigel, actually, I hear that you're going off to uh, star in a film based on the life of... Uh, that most um, perfect British gentleman or English gentleman, David Niven. Yes, indeed, at the end of the year, yes. It's going to be um, a daunting prospect I mean, yeah. I for him. Um, what about the physical resemblance? Uh, well, funnily enough, um, I, think that's, I think I can probably get away with that, <coughs> if getting away is the right mm. term. But uh, as we've been talking about uh, this now, about uh, the script is the all-important thing. Mm. And this is, uh, we're going to adapt uh, The Moon's a Balloon, so yes. it's not just a, a, a history of his life, it's actually an a adaptation of a novel, mm. if you can call it a novel. It's really a, a sort of it's rambling... A it's a series of anecdotes, really. A series of anecdotes, and, yeah. very, it, and that's a, a very good thing yeah. to film. It's actually, it's mm. perfect, for, for it transfers to the screen extremely well. Mm. But uh, as you were saying, and this is why my admiration for John is so enormous, you see, but without a script, I really have nothing to go mm. on as an actor. And... Um, well, that I mean, that is the meat of everything I do, is the, is the text. I think that's at last being recognised, isn't it, John, after a long battle, yes. that the writer is actually rather important. I think that the great British public probably think the, the actors make up all the lines as they go along. Mm. Yeah. Mm. <laughs>
I but the thing about yeah. sorry, yeah. Say, say about Niven, who I did name very well, is that he was undoubtedly the greatest raconteur mm. and teller of stories that ever existed. And I suppose they must be, there must be old television shows where you can see them, him doing it. Absolutely, that. yes. And it is the most, I mean, better, I think, I'm a, probably better than any performance he ever gave in any uh, Yeah, John, any John it's interesting the fact that you knew him, because I've been reading a lot of books mm. and uh, biographies about him recently, and a lot of the time his acting ability seems to be slighted in these books. People did not take him seriously as an actor. Was he was a very he accomplished, I think he was a very accomplished light comedy actor, but as a, as a talker he was a genius, mm. and a real genius. He was stunning, and he also yes. had this very English thing, self-deprecating style that he, he, did. He, he mocked himself. So he was always he? the butt of his own anecdote. Yes, and he but, had irony and all these But he was things. also the night, the one little tiny thing, we asked him to lunch in the country, and I drove to my house half an hour before the lunch, and I fa saw him in the distance walking down a country lane, and he he didn't want to knock at the door, you know, before he was time, so they would be walking around the country. Mm. Incredibly Goodness wonderful me. man. And then I saw him when he was dying, and he, had, he couldn't speak, and he said, it's because I've talked too much all my life, I can't speak now. You know? And mm. made a joke and laughed. Marvellous, marvellous, wonderful marvellous man. Actor. Very sweet. Mm. It'd be interesting to see the portrayal of that anyway. Nigel, thank really you very much indeed for coming in. Thank you, John, for coming Pleasure. in today. Really, really enjoyed it. And glad we finally got through to your father, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it from Open Air for today, but do join us tomorrow. When